Hello, folks. Kent Stanford here with Alabama Extension talking to you today about uh, some of the concepts related to temporary electric fencing. I guess the first question we'll address today is why do we uh, even think about using temporary electric fencing? Well, the biggest reason that we can discuss is that it allows us to uh, do proper grazing management. I think it's important that we understand that allows us to utilize all the grazing resources on our farms. It allows us to uh, maybe think about some of those areas that are a bit more challenging uh, to incorporate into our grazing rotation. Maybe you have a woodlot, maybe there's an area uh, with kudzu that you can utilize at certain times of the year. It provides a few days worth of grazing for you. And so really it allows us to put those animals in a certain place for a certain amount of time uh, to maximize the, the grazing potential there allows us to work with some of these challenging sites. Uh, that might be terrain, that might be woods, uh, really provides an opportunity for us to, uh, to work through some of those situations uh, where a permanent fence uh, would really not be feasible. Temporary electric fence works very well for us to create lanes. We can use these as travel lanes back to a uh, pen, back to some permanent fence, uh, to an area where we can uh, put those animals uh, to do whatever practices maybe we need to with them. And as long as they are accustomed to moving on a regular basis, uh, they don't know the difference between moving to the pen versus moving to the next uh, area that we've allocated for grazing. So the lane concept works very well once they are broke to the fence and they respect the fence. And I think we have to understand also, anytime we're using electric fence, this is not a physical boundary. We're talking about a mental barrier here. Once they have that electrical shock for the first time, uh, they respect that fence and they don't try it anymore. One of the huge advantages uh, to using temporary electric fence is that it's easy. The installation is fast. It doesn't require a lot of special tools and it provides us in just really short order a uh, chance to put up some fence that uh, that is very, very effective. And finally, uh, it's highly economical with just a very few components that are required and we'll talk about some of those. So anytime we're talking about electric fence, uh, there are three main parts. We talk about the energizer first. It gets the most attention. It can create, it can be the, uh, the one that costs the most money. So the energizer, some people call them chargers. We're in the South, so typically we'll call them chargers. But the energizer is a main consideration for us uh, with electric fences. We also uh, wanna think about the, the actual fence itself. I suppose for the discussion today, uh, what we'll be discussing is, uh, is, is not a whole lot of fence. That's the advantage with temporary electric. We're not talking about a, a lot of uh, individual parts, but the fence itself uh, is one of the, uh, the main three components uh, to electric fence. Then finally, the ground, and we'll talk a, a bit more about that. Uh, I also include uh, the tools of the trade, and we have a picture here of a fault finder uh, that we have in a temporary grazing kit that we have put together in our state. Uh, these fault finders to me are a requirement if you're going to have electric fence around. It allows you to check that fence uh, correctly. You can get a reading on the voltage that's on the fence, what kind of draw you have there, as well as uh, allow you to find any faults or grounds that might be on the fence. So let's talk a bit more about the energizer itself. First thing I want you to understand is that there are lots of options lots of options on the market. In some of the photos today, you'll see a specific brand. It's important for you to understand that we have a temporary grazing kit that we put together in Alabama last year. We had some funding through NRCS, a project that we worked on with them to get some of these kits uh, scattered across the state to show producers how easy they are to operate. And so the brand that you'll see uh, in the pictures today uh, happens to be uh, the one that uh, we utilized uh, for this particular project. But there are lots of options. There are lots of different manufacturers out there that uh, produce uh, not only the energizers, but other components of fence, of these electric fences. And so it's important that you uh, read as much as you can. Most of these manufacturers have very uh, user-friendly websites. You can go on there, make a comparison between the different manufacturers, uh, find the one that works best for you. They come in lots of different options in terms of uh, the power source. So you can have the 110 volt plug-in style. You can have those that run off a battery. 
In that case, this would be a battery like a deep a cycle marine battery that you would swap out every so often once it uh, runs down a bit. Then there's the solar slash battery operator where the solar panel uh, serves to, uh, to keep the battery charged up. And then finally, we have those that are strictly solar. There's some common terms that we need to understand when it comes to energizers. The stored joules or the energy that will be placed onto the fence uh, versus the release joules um, is important. So uh, when we talk about stored joules, that's the joules that the charger actually produces and then it releases uh, a certain percent of that. So that might range from 60% of the stored joules that are released up to maybe a high of 80 or 85% uh, that is actually released onto the fence. So those are differences in the chargers or in the energizers between the different companies and you just need to understand uh, how much of the energy is being released uh, by that particular brand and that particular model. Also, uh, most of these energizers are going to be sold uh, with some other terminology listed on the label or on the box. They will typically say up to or have an up to distance uh, listed on that label. But we have to understand that that up to means a clean fence line. Uh, the recommended distance for a normal fence might also be listed or you might have to dig a bit deeper onto the website or into the material to understand uh, what the recommended distance is uh, for more of a normal fence line, and that can be quite a bit of difference. So understand uh, what we're talking about there. And usually this is shown in uh, in number of miles of fence or in the number of acres that, uh, that it will uh, fence in. Uh, since we're talking about temporary today, uh, we have to understand that temporary requires a much smaller energizer versus a permanent fence installation. We're talking about smaller distances. We're typically talking about fences that we might be moving every two to three days. And so the smaller energizers are very effective because of the smaller distances. So now let's talk a bit about the fence itself. And again, for the temporary applications, we would be looking at something like a poly wire, poly tape, or poly rope. Uh, those come in different uh, sizes. Uh, if you look at the different uh, products on the market, you can see that within each one of these uh, broad categories, there can be quite a bit of difference uh, in the materials that are there. Those are typically going to be a braided product of some type, uh, and you have the fibers that are actually carrying uh, the electricity interwoven uh, with a composite or a plastic or some sort of synthetic fiber. As you move from a poly wire uh, to a tape, uh, you increase visibility. Oftentimes the tape is used uh, for equine applications where horses need to see uh, maybe a bit more, and so uh, the tape uh, is going to be a, a little bit heavier, uh, but it will be a bit more visible versus the poly wire. And then when you move to a poly rope, uh, that's a bigger diameter, maybe the size of your finger, and so these products are going to be a bit, uh, quite a bit heavier, and they will require uh, a closer line post spacing because of the weight uh, of that actual product. Uh, they're much higher in visibility versus, say, a 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire, which is kind of a standard product that we see. These products are also uh, very flexible. They're going to be much lighter compared to the wire. Uh, that flexibility allows us to, uh, to run that at whatever angle, whatever turn we need to make uh, without any problem. Um, on these temporary applications, we normally will be talking about tread-in style posts, something that's easy to put in, something that's easy to take out. And then the final component on the fence side of things would be a reel that we would use to uh, actually roll up or to reel in uh, our poly wire, the tape or the rope that we might be using. So here we have a couple of pictures of some of the common posts. Uh, just so happens these are the two post styles that we included in our temporary kits, uh, the ring style or pigtail style on the left, uh, and then more of a traditional square type uh, post on the right. This is a close-up view of the tread on the bottom, so you can see uh, we're not talking about a huge tread. These are going to be fairly lightweight, so they're going to be easy to carry around and relatively easy to, uh, to push into the ground. If you've got rocky ground, um, these will be a bit of a challenge for you. So you have to move it around a bit, maybe till you find that 
a spot that's soft enough to get it to sink into the ground all the way. Here's a close-up uh, shot of those posts up at the top of the post. You can see the ring style or pigtail style here uh, with the slot at the bottom that easily slides the, uh, uh, the poly wire uh, into. Um, and then you just simply twist the post and, uh, and then put it into the ground. Uh, the post on the right, the close up there, you can see a little different style uh, as, uh, as you see where the poly wire goes into the top of the post. A big advantage there on the, uh, the style on the right, the white post, you have an opportunity to put multiple strands up at different heights where the limitation to the ring top is that uh, you only have one option uh, for one strand. So close up here on the reel, this happens to be a geared reel, so it makes uh, the roll up uh, or the reeling in a bit faster and the standard handle uh, that came with uh, this product that we used in our kit. The ground probably is the one thing related to electric fence building that people don't pay enough attention to. I think we get real focused on the energizers and on the actual fence itself. Uh, and over the years, as I've worked with producers, probably over 90% of the issues that I've helped people with uh, were, rela were related to not having uh, the system grounded correctly. So the rule of thumb is that we would have one ground rod for every four joules of power plus one rod. So in essence, you would always have a minimum of two ground rods uh, six foot ground rods driven into the ground. Uh, we would put those 10 feet apart in moist soil. Many times producers will put these under the eave of a barn uh, so that you get the runoff uh, from rainfall and keeps that soil uh, with a little more moisture to it. Uh, temporary systems still need a good ground, but they don't have to have uh, that type of ground uh, just because we're talking about a much smaller charger. Uh, the picture here is of a, a T-style handle uh, on a ground rod that is used for the temporary setups. It's a three-foot rod, so we don't have to have quite the, uh, the same setup as we would for a more permanent application. East of the Mississippi River, we typically uh, tell producers that they can run an all-hot setup, that they don't have to take a ground wire along the fence line for the animals to touch the ground wire and the hot wire in order to, uh, to get a shock. Uh, our ground is normally uh, going to have enough moisture in it that the animals uh, can get a shock uh, for having touched the hot wire. So we recommend an all hot setup, meaning all strands would be hot. And in some of these temporary applications, I've seen producers that uh, maybe could not get one of these uh, T-style uh, ground rods into the ground, but they did uh, have an opportunity to drive in an actual T-post and it served the purpose uh, for the short duration that the fence would be set up there. So look at other options if you're having trouble with the ground, but it's terribly important to get the ground done correctly. And finally, uh, I want to thank you for your time today and to uh, let you know that just because uh, you saw some specific manufacturers listed in here. That does not necessarily imply endorsement on our part. Again, we have a project ongoing in our state with funding through NRCS that we're happy to have uh, to showcase uh, these type uh, materials to producers to help them uh, increase the number of grazing days and hopefully decrease the number of hay feeding days so that they can be more profitable in their ventures. For more information, you can go to aces.edu and search for information on this topic and others, and we thank you for your time.